one hand in speaking. That is what is recorded in the history. The whole year the Kawaka just met one bearded smelly white man. <laughs> seconds a child is dying of malaria in Africa now to get the dose of life-saving uh, um, anti-malaria is about five dollars but there's no government to give anti anti-malaria uh, when somebody gets malaria if they have no money they get ill and die so my quest the question that I was asking and many people were asking was if you really want to help children why begin with a disease that they don't have? Why, why not go home? Why not look for something that is killing them? This is, this is Ox Oxford, Cambridge, where you go to get this degree where you get the first degree, which is a, a BA, bachelor's degree. You know, they don't believe in marriage. So they don't, you know, the only thing they can give you is a bachelor's degree, you know? So, so, because you can stumble on a conference like this and get shocked when a few ideas are thrown in your head. I don't believe what Nana Sekhmet said. I don't believe that kind of stuff. It's okay. You know, they teach you how to critique, not to believe anything. You know, when they say, when they, when, when they, they say, uh, what do you think about black people building their own institutions? You say, well, is it has its own advantages and disadvantages. <laughs> um, the high culture of Egyptian civilization that starts around the Nile Valley eventually ends up here, in the Giza Plateau, in the pyramids of Giza, one of the highest high technical civilizations that African people put together, starting all the way from Uganda, covering present-day Sudan, and going up here in Egypt.
has established that more than seven million years ago, a black woman stretched forth her hands under God and gave us the first human being. In the beginning was a black woman. This black woman lived at the foothills of the mountains of the moon. This black woman lived in the Idracostan region known in ancient time as the land of the gods. This black woman lived at the source of the Nile. This black woman lived between the two domes of the Great Rift Valley. This black woman's genes run through the genes of every human being. This black woman's DNA is the string that connects every person that walks on earth. That is why we say that let him that is worthy be worthy still, and let him that is righteous be righteous still. So behold, I come quickly. My reward is with me to give unto every man and woman for and according to his reward should be. For in the beginning was a black woman. This woman gave rise to a human. Never was a time when a black woman was not. Never will be time when black people will cease to be. Because we are eternal, my brothers and sisters. In the name of the Creator, revealed to all and known by many names. In the name of our ancestors whose legacy we must all bear. And I bear witness as an African man, and we bear witness as African people, that as our beginning was great and good, so shall our development eternity be. So if you dare, you speak truth, you do justice, and you walk into the ways of righteousness. In the name of African people that were the first people to populate the world. In the name of African people that populated Africa. In the name of African people that left Africa to populate Europe. And they were the first people to populate Europe at the stage of Gromordi. In the name of African people that were there as the Bika and even before the Bika in Europe, in, 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 in England. In the name of the Fremorians that inhabited Ireland. In the name of the Dravidians, the first people to populate India. In the name of African people known as the Ainu and the Masaba Negroes who populated Japan. And that's why Japanese names are like African names. In the name of African people that populated China known as the Semans. In the name of African people that followed Balingia and found themselves in South America. In the name of African people that turned all those mountains into jaguars and built temples of Zerapotation, Trezapotation, Tuxla, in the name of African merchants, you know, who put boats into the seas, Ethiopian seas, in the name of the Ethiopians of Thebes, in the name of the Egyptians, in the name of the ancient people of Kemet, in the name of Taseti, of Tameri, of Tanehis, in the name of Tatmoses, in the name of Ramses, in the name of Menkura, in the name of Shaure, in the name of African people everywhere who have been involved with the struggle to liberate African people. For we say today that let him that is worthy be worthy still, let him that is righteous be righteous still, and let him that is wicked be wicked still. Behold, I come quickly. My reward is with me to give unto every man and every woman for and according to his reward should be. In the beginning was a black woman, and this woman gave rise to a human. Never was a time when black people were not, and never will be time when black people will cease to be. On our satellite feeds at uh, TV Africa, I have been watching the different countries that have been celebrating these so-called jubilees. And they have been promising their population how there is always something better in the days ahead. Politicians are always full of these promises. They are always full of talking about what is going to happen next year and that next year will be better than today. And the African politicians are better at this because we African people are essentially people who are optimists as opposed to ice people or the people in Europe 
who are pessimists. African people have got optimist mentality. And then other people have got pessimist mentality. In Africa, a man will have nothing to eat. And on that day, he will not worry. You know, he will say, you know, God will provide or something is going to happen or my relatives will give me something. That is optimism. African people approach life from an optimistic perspective. But that optimistic perspective can also be exploited by people with bad intent, especially politicians. Politicians can exploit our optimism. We always believe that next year will be better than today. Tomorrow will be better than yesterday. But let's not forget that today is based on what happened yesterday. So for all our studies, the best subject qualified to reward our research is nothing better, is nothing better than history. History of all our studies is the best qualified to reward all our research. Now, most of these politicians have been promising their country growth, a significant percent. And that significant percent is not significant. It's uh, 6 percent, 7 percent. If you know a percent, a percent is a proportion of 100. If your economy grows by 6 percent, it means it has not literally grown at all. Because 6 percent is not even a statistical minimum. Those of you who have studied statistics know that a statistical minimum is 33 percent. So your economy has grown by 6%, well, be fired because it hasn't grown at all. It means it has not grown by 94%. But that's not the point of today's discussion. That is not the point of today's lecture. Today, I am intent on explaining to you, one, that the subject you study are the people you lead. And one characteristic of African people is that we don't study. We don't study, we don't read. We don't know, we don't care. We assume that what we know is the end of everything. We assume that what we have been told is the end of everything. In fact, in countries like Uganda, Tanzania or Kenya, if a man holds the Bible and reads it, that is the end of all learning. They believe that the Bible has got every answer. And that is why you see all these now prayer breakfasts, praying to God to save the nation. Now I want to tell you something, you on your prayer breakfast, that God is always on the side of the strongest battalions. God never sides with the weak. No, God always sides on the strong because God can't be a loser. He's not going to lose. But in almost all these jubilees that people have been celebrating, they have been talking about how the economies will grow, how roads will be constructed, how children will go to school, the number of students enrolled, how universities will expand, how factories and electricity, everything. But they have not prepared their country for its own defense. They have not. How are they going to defend a country? How are they strategically positioned to exist even in the next 30 or 40 years? They don't know. And most of these politicians making these promises anyway, they don't even run their country. No. These countries in Africa now are not run by the politicians we put in office. They are run by corporations. Corporations dictate what happens into that particular country. Corporations like Walmart. Corporations like Apple. Corporations like Microsoft. Corporations, even mini corporations like MTN. These are the corporations owned by transnational companies that want border-free economies that do not want to respect laws made in these countries, that want every citizen of that country to be a servant 
of a corporation that produces cheap goods for the Anglo-American empire. That is one thing. Above these corporations are multinational banks. The banks control the corporations by making sure that these corporations have got sufficient monies. Now, these multinational banks, the type of Barclays, the type of, uh, of, of, of uh, J.P. Morgan, the type of National Westminster, Hong Kong, Shanghai, these multinational banks dictate who becomes a president in a country. They dictate what type of economy Uganda should have, what type of oil Uganda should mine, what type of resources they dictate because they are under the umbrella of now another government, which is the World Bank, the IMF, and the Inter-American Bank. The World Bank is essentially a government that governs governments. The president of the World Bank is more important to an economy or to a country than your own president. They literally exercise veto powers on these countries by controlling the flow of any of resources, of money. They dictate. They come to a country and force it into poverty. Tell you to sell everything that you have. Tell you to depreciate your currency, to make it weak. So that the products that you produce become cheap for Anglo-American empire. Their main philosophy is to produce more and earn less. They are telling you to produce more and to earn less. So these banks, IMF, World Bank, Inter-American banks, run the corporations and force these corporations into strategic positions so they effectively take over government. They dictate what your president does, what your minister does, or what your parliament does. The most of, the, of these politicians, they don't know what time it is. They don't know what is going on. But in addition to these banks running these countries like they are their backyard or they are just a garden or plantation economies, there is something else more sinister. There is the intent of having a one world government one world government and this one world government will give, be governed from Washington and the finance will be controlled by London and the spiritual system and the spiritual center will be in Rome and basically the owners or the runners of this world will be the same a few families that are hell-bent on controlling the world now in the attempt to control the world they are using the military, the U.S. military, the Anglo-American military. Now we call it NATO, but NATO is effective America. America is NATO. There is nothing else. You know? America is also the United Nations. There is no such a thing as the United Nations. The United Nations means America. Where you see United Nations, just read the United States of America. United Nations, United States of America. Because the United Nations is one of the most undemocratic institutions. It's very undemocratic. You have the General Assembly, and then you have the Security Council. The Security Council controls what the United Nations does, controls the General Assembly. And in the Security Council, you have permanent members. These permanent members com complain about permanent leaders. When you have a leader that has been in power for 30 years or 40 years or 50 years, they complain. Let us change him. Let us have another leader. But you have veto powers from 1945. They are not changing. And you can decide what happens in the world. It is a mistake for countries to belong to the United Nations, which is a dictatorship run by the Anglo-American Empire. In China has got veto powers. Russia has got veto powers. France has got veto powers. Uh, Britain has got veto powers. America has got veto powers. And literally everybody there has got veto powers. Africa has none. South America has none. 
So what is the aim? The aim is to have a one world government that is controlled from Washington. With the finance, they want one monetary system. They want no borders. They don't want your politician. Have you planned for that? No. But let me tell you something more sinister. Something more deadly. Something that will spare the doom of the entire world. Especially here in Africa. And that is called geoengineering. The ability to make earthquakes. To make floods. The ability to change weather. Weather modification and weather guidance to modify the weather so that if you want a flood happening somewhere, you can have it. Whether you have a landslide, you can have it. Whether you can have a tornado, you can have it. A Serbian named Tesla, who is the man who perfected electricity, was the one who came with the whole idea of electromagnetic, electromag electromagnetic system of electricity. He, he is obscure because uh, he being Serbian and being a refugee in America, most of his invention was rescued from him, was uh, uh, stolen from him. But he created the notion of electromagneticism, which has been used by the military to create earthquakes, including meltdowns in the Arctic. Basically, what can happen is if they want to have rain in Uganda, they can bring clouds into Uganda that will bring rain to Uganda for more than one year. They can have tornadoes and tsunamis. Now, if you have a plane thinking that it's going to descend you, you know, in very bad weather, the plane is worth nothing. They send a beam, electromagnetic beam, through the heavens and back to earth. However, that beam leaves a trail. And that trail or that residue can be seen. And this is what happened to Haiti. Haiti is a tsunami, Haiti is a flood. Haiti is earthquake. It was no accident. Now, I don't know what happens in Bududa, in Mbale, whether it is an accident or not. But believe me, there is capacity to create floods and earthquakes and tsunamis and landslides and mudslides similar to what you see in Mbali. And volcanoes, volcanic eruptions, and have all these tsunamis. Now, Haiti is a very good example because America has invaded Haiti more than five times. Haiti is the only example of independence where slaves rose up and overthrew the French white man, the British white man, and the Spanish white man. They defeated 150,000 soldiers of Napoleon's army of the Pyrenees, led and commanded by Napoleon's brother, Lalek. Defeated them completely. Changed that country from Haiti to from Saint Domingue and called it Haiti. It was unprecedented. The first time slaves ever rose up, overthrew their master, and established an independent state. And that example was not allowed to happen, to continue. Haiti could not be allowed to be successful because at its time, Haiti produced almost 80% of French's GDP. So Haiti has been punished over and over. And one of the biggest punishment was the earthquake that killed thousands, hundreds of thousands of people that almost reduced that country to rubble. Haiti's earthquake. In order to produce an earthquake, in order to produce an earthquake, what they are doing is they hit the ionosphere. How do they hit the ionosphere? They send a strong pulse of electromagnetic waves through the heavens back to earth. You know, and then use plasma rays to cause the earthquake. So that electromagnetic wave that is sent through the ionosphere is able to cause seismic changes on earth 
for the earthquake to happen. It leaves trails. Most of what you are seeing now, the chemin trails all over Europe, over, over Europe and America, citizens are almost at war because of chemin trails. Planes that spray toxins in the atmosphere. These planes exist. They spray toxins in the atmosphere. And what is the intention? The intention is to have a weapon. A weapon that is so simple. That weapon called weather modification. If you want to take Uganda and clear everybody out of Uganda, you don't even have to fight Uganda. No, you take the clouds away. You take the clouds away so that there is a drought. And the droughts last three years. Uganda does not have silos. We don't have food that can feed our population of 36 million for all this period of time. So if the cloud is moved away and then there is a drought, we shall move in search of food away from Uganda. And then the UN, remember when I said UN, United States, can then set up a refugee camp in, North America, in, in northern Kenya and we can all go to northern Kenya. Then we have cleared out of Uganda. And then the food will run out and will start dying in our thousands. Because that is the aim. The aim is to reduce world population by 800 million. There is also another aim. The aim is to weaken central governments so that the governments have no power. And these governments have recognized this. And they have almost bought into it. Because if you're a government that doesn't provide employment for your citizens, if you have nothing, no factory that you make, if you don't have anything that you control, when people come to ask for jobs, what will you say? Send them to multinational companies. You have people now who are saying, me, I want to work for the UN. Me, I want to work for USAID. Me, I want to work for UNICEF. I don't want to work for government. You can be working for government, and as soon as a job is advertised at the World Bank, zoom! You run. Last time I met a gentleman who used to run UCC, and I said, traitor. He says, I want to work for an international organization so that the citizens lose faith in their own government. Now, most of these uh, uh, governments, the so-called Anglo-American empire, are also pushing a lot of money into civil societies, what they call civil societies, private organizations. So, in these private organizations, the private organizations are supposed to get a lot of resources, provide some of the work the government is supposed to be doing, and at the same time move people away from their government. So, should there come a time when they want to overthrow that particular government, then all these civil societies will rise up and condemn the government because that is the intention. Does our government know this? No, it is asleep. Does our government care? No. Because mostly, most of the, in most of these states, a few individuals hijack the government and the instruments of administration and use it purposely for their own benefit. Not to benefit the citizens, no. If you wanted to benefit your citizens, you would fund research. You would have libraries in your towns in your street. You would have museums. You would have control processes of socialization. If you don't have a library, if you are paying high prices for internet and electricity, how is somebody even going to sit down and research geo, geo engineering and research chemtrails and research HAP weather modification? We can do it at TV Africa. And in fact, we're going to show you now, HAP, a factory, an establishment very big that does weather modification, that causes earthquakes and tsunamis and tornadoes and floods, that interferes into the seas and creates tornadoes and waves and even goes to the Arctic and leads to the melting of the Arctic and the so-called solar ice cap, all melted by artificial, and it's not even one government that does it, it's not just America. Russia knows how to do this, 
France and, and Britain know how to do this. We are the African nations. We are sleeping. Why? Because our leaders, our politicians, because our institutions are all starved. Starved first by the multinational corporations, starved second by multinational banks, and then the international, this IMF and the Inter-American Bank that doesn't even want to fund higher education, that doesn't even want to fund research, doesn't want to invest in railways, doesn't want to invest in museums, doesn't want to invest in libraries. You go to a library and there isn't even a book. Even high prestigious institutions like Chimaka, their library is pitiful. How are you going to research this? If your school is Chiswara Primary School, and the only thing that you do is come and build a couple of walls, put some very rough desks and disappear. And then you ask this child who is in Karamoja to sit the same exam as somebody who is studying in Sudiri school. It is totally unfair. A person goes to Nakasero Kampara parents. He has two teachers in a classroom, cramming everything that you are giving him. And then he's sitting with somebody in Nabira took same exam. If your education system is poor, the result will be poor. The result will be poverty. Your education system does not fund research. And then you are not even setting targets. You are not even saying to them, by the time you finish senior four, you must have invented something. If you don't know how to make a motorcycle, you cannot qualify to go to high school. That should be it. If I am finishing senior primary seven, my test should be, I have invented something of great worth to my society. As long as I can demonstrate the invention, I should be the top student in the country. I shouldn't be the top student in the country because they store exams and give them to me. I shouldn't be the top student in the country because they brought, they asked me the question that my teacher had, had told me that they'd be asking me the day before. Rote learning, just regurgitating and repeating what they told me. No. I am the best student in the country because I am able to manufacture a microphone. I am the best student in my country because I have made a mobile phone and I have pieced it together. And if you want 10 mobile phones, I'll do them. Because I have done a small short wave, you know, ultra high frequency transmitter. I am therefore the best student. I need to graduate now to go to secondary school and I get a government scholarship. But government gives you scholarship for what? You get a scholarship because you got A's in science by reading a book and repeating what is in the book. You continue to university and then you finish. What is that education system? It is education system for the republic of nothing. You are worse off. You have studied, you studied medicine. And all you do is just learn how to write a couple of, uh, of, of phrases that you have read in a book and do some practice. You do not study hearing. You don't make medicine. What you do is what we call, in our language, mechanical view of health. Your kidney is wrong, we take it out. What have you replaced my kidney with? Nothing. The job that could be done by one kidney is now done by two kidneys is now done by one kidney. That is a poor education system. That education system is not going to defend us against the threats that are emerging because nobody wants black people anywhere in the world. The world population is supposed to reduce to 800 million from 6 billion because the argument is that the world can't contain it. When you hear of life expectancy, that life expectancy is somebody expects you to die early so that you don't use the world resources. If you don't die early and you live up to 70, you will use world, more resources. So the question you should be asking yourself is, who precisely expects me to die? And what will you do if I don't? 
If you don't die, you will use more resources. And if you use more resources, there will be less resources for the Anglo-American Empire. Let me tell you something else. Yes. In Africa, South America, among the poor nations, the song is always population control. Reduce your population. To be fair to the president of Uganda, he has opposed that. He has accepted everything else white people have been throwing at him. Receive this, receive this, he has accepted. But he has refused population control. However, the parliament of Uganda has been apportioning and the parliament of Kenya and the parliament of Tanzania and the parliament of other countries have been apportioning a lot of resources to reduce population control to the extent that they are now saying they should give contraceptives and morning after pills to children in school. First of all, I want to tell you that what they call contraceptives and morning after pills are nothing but they are not just birth control, they are sterilization pills. You take it at your peri. Its job is to enable your body to reject the fetus, to sterilize you. And that is why even when you come off, you find it very difficult to conceive. So you take it at your peri. You take it knowing that it will be very difficult for you to get pregnant, even if you want to. But just think of the concept, somebody coming into your country and telling you you are too many, reduce your population, like I come into your home, and I'm saying, oh, are these all your children? They are too many. Who, why are they not telling white people there are too many? Britain, which is the same size as Uganda, has almost a population of 70 million people, and they don't have any resources. What are the natural resources of England? A bit of coal that is not exploitable. A little bit of oil in the North Sea. And some potatoes. Now, an average European eats more food, uses more resources a day than 100 Africans in a year. So if you really want to save the world resources, who are the people that should be reduced? It should be Europeans. And Americans, white people should be reduced because if you reduce the number of white people, there'd be enough resources for everyone. Why do I say that? It is because they are greedy, they eat more. So if you remove somebody who eats more, then those who eat proportionately small portions can have enough. The whole world would live better if white people weren't eating everything up. But the person who is eating everything up is not even satisfied with the gratonious lifestyle that he's living. No, he wants to reduce the population even of those who are eating less. How can you accept to participate in your own genocide? How can you accept to participate in race suicide? Because that's what they're asking us to do. They are asking us to kill ourselves. They are asking us to murder ourselves, kill your children, kill the unborn, sterilize yourself. They are, they are, we don't want black people on earth. And the best thing we can do is kill them. And that is why when there was that earthquake in Haiti, the first thing that arrived in Haiti was contraceptives and condoms. When there was that flood, Tsunami that hit New Orleans, the first thing that hit New Orleans, which was a black population, was contraceptives and condoms. So I am here to tell you today that as you move in forward into life, as you think of projecting your country into the stratosphere, as you think of moving forward, you are forgetting that particular strategic importance, survival. Not only survival because you have food, no. Self-preservation. Your self-preservation is not going to be assured unless you have enough information. I am not responsible for your miseducation. I didn't miseducate you. But I am responsible for your mental liberation. And one of the key things that you must understand now is weather modification. 
whether modification, the ability of white nations to make floods, to make tsunamis, to make tornadoes, to make earthquakes, to make mudslides, similar to what you have seen in Mbali, similar to what you have seen the floods that hit Mozambique, the same country the Portuguese were fighting over, hit by tsunami, tornado. Malaysia, no, Indonesia, which was a powerful giant nation rising up, hit by a tornado. Haiti, the biggest example of our independence, hit by a tornado. So as you think of defending your country, while you are doing a bad job anyway, showing us these tiny little planes going up in the sky, and just a few things in water modification can bring them tumbling down, just like they did recently. So you must think about weather modification and to prove it, I'm going to play for you a place in Alaska called HAP. You are going to see the experts in HAP telling you what they do and the experiments that they conduct for weather modification. And then you must invest in your own education but not this miseducation that you have running around here of students passing exam. Demand the impossible out of your students. Give them tasks they have to achieve. Let it be based on invention. And the best student who has achieved something is one who has invented it. Order is coming. And this new world order does not respect black people. In fact, the new world order does not want black people. The new Anglo-Saxon American order is coming. It will invade countries for resources. That doctrine of if we want something for our empire, we must go and take it. And if you don't liaise with us or accept us, then we shall remove that government and replace it with another government. The thing about the Anglo-American Empire is it always does the same thing over and over again. If you are an African leader and you don't know that Patrice Rumumba was overthrown by the CIA, then you don't know nothing. If you don't know that Kwame Nkrumah was overthrown by the CIA, in fact the station chief of the CIA was Howard Bain. If you don't know that the CIA tried to remove Angola, the MPLM government in Angola, if you don't know that the Anglo-American Empire has just overthrown Kano Gaddafi, that the Anglo-American Empire overthrew Mossadegh in Iran, that they killed Maurice Bishop in Grenada, that they have been attempting now for the last 10 years, almost succeeded in overthrowing Hugo Chavez, that they tried to invade Chuba under the Bay of Pigs, that they killed Salvador Allende and replaced him with a dictatorship. That they killed President Sukarno, who called the Bandung Conference of all non-aligned nations. The list is endless. Their tactics are the same. Accept the Anglo-American hegemony or be brushed aside. Now these countries like Kenya, these countries like Uganda that have oil, these countries like Sudan, Congo of Patrice Rumumba. The all that we have, they try to psych you up by saying it's a curse. But do you know that one of the most insidious organizations that is involved in toppling governments everywhere, a company called Harry Button that is already in Uganda, that is in Hoima. It is prospecting for oil. The same Harry Button that caused havoc in Iraq and in many other countries of Dick Cheney and the project for the new American century that says everybody should be a slave under the Anglo-American Empire. I am telling you this as a nation so that you know all these things that I'm saying have happened before in other countries. When you see people in Iraq running, don't think they caused, they have done anything wrong. When you see people in Palestine, they have done nothing wrong. 
When you see people in Vietnam, don't think they have done anything wrong. When you hear people in Cambodia and in Laos, they have done nothing wrong. No. They just happened to be non-white people. They just happened to be in the path of the Anglo-American Empire. And in order to defend yourself as a nation, you must build a sufficient body of information. Because knowledge is power. Land is the basis of independence, freedom, justice, and righteousness. It is not power. Knowledge is power. So you need to know the techniques that the empire uses to overthrow governments. And you also need to know what is coming. And what is coming is weather modification. That weather modification has to be understood has to be studied. Our students must be tasked by knowing weather modification. How do you create rainfall? How do you take it away? How do you create a tornado? How do you create a flood? How do you create a tsunami? How do you create a mudslide? Geo engineering. We have to understand this. How do you create a movement in a plate underneath the earth? Underneath the earth, the crust where we're standing, the plate, the mantle, the inner core, the outer core. How can you move this so that you have a volcano? We are not supposed to see a volcano and just go and stand in amazement of look at the volcano. The volcano that destroyed Montserrat. All these experiments that have been carried out in the Caribbean and in the Pacific, they are going to come to Africa. Throughout history, or as far as we can remember, nations that have less resources have always invaded those that have resources to take their resources and make them their own. When you study Alexander the Greek, Alexander the Greek goes into almost every part of the known world looking for what? Looking for resources. Resources for the Macedonians. His father Philip was a plunderer. He in fact first killed the people in Athens, in Thebes. 30,000 people murdered them and plunders their resources. When he goes into Pasha and he's looking for Darius, and he sits in Darius's cottage and Darius, you know, water fountains and looks at Darius's bed and gold and scarlet robes. He says, my God, my friend, this is royalty. He says to the Macedonians, we come from poverty-stricken Europe. Europe didn't exist at the time, but poverty-stricken Macedonia. And we are going to go victorious. Every time he stood to inspire his troops, he would tell them about what they are going to plunder. That is why we don't call him Alexander the Great. We call him Alexander the Greek, Alexander the Thief, Alexander the th Plunderer. He goes up to India plundering. At one stage, the plunder is so much for the troops, they can't move. So they have to first take it back to their home to come back and begin the campaign. When you hear of Rome, Rome invades Africa, North Africa, looking for resources, takes over the whole of North Africa, and use it to, pr to plunder, to steal, and to feed the Roman Empire with the grain that is produced in Africa. At the time Rome invades Africa, the whole of North Africa, even the Sahara Desert, was actually a plain grassland. And it was uh, the food that was to feed the animals that were used in Roman sport and in the Colosseum and that were feeding the Roman soldiers and the Roman uh, uh, legions and the goats that, had, that were being you know, reared for the Roman Empire that actually reduced the Sahara to a desert. Now, it had already, of course, started being a desert about 7,000 B.C., but in order to defeat the Roman Empire, the Vandals invade Africa from Spain and cut off the breadbasket of the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire has been recreated by the Anglo-American Empire. That is why you see all the myths, all the, um, you know, the, 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 the power structures 
Rome had the Senate, America had the Senate. Rome had the Congress, America had the Congress. Rome had a dictator, America has a dictator in form of the president. You know. So the type of architecture that you see in ancient Egypt transferred to Greece, transferred to Rome, rebuilt in America and Britain. So the countries that do not have resources have throughout history invaded those that have resources. And when they invade, they pillage and they murder the population. Rest the population stays and rises up and becomes strong again to come and defeat it. That is what Rome did with Carthage. After the Africans had gone into Rome and defeated the Romans in Rome, ruled Rome for 14 years under Hannibal Baca and Hasbanapo and Hasdrubal. When Rome eventually manages to get the back of the Africans by tricking Hannibal back into Africa and defeats him at the Battle of Zama, they destroy Carthage completely. And they are never to rise again. So you must understand that what is being played, history, history always repeats itself. And it will continue repeating itself until we stop it repeating itself. Thank you.